here's what we're going to talk about. The first four are going to be lots about instruments, lots of moving gases, things moving up and down. I'll describe them as we go along. Uh, the first one is sample preparation, and here I've got a little ISO tree, and those of you in the lab will, will see that each one of these little branches up here is a different sample preparation system that you're going to be exposed to in the next two weeks. We have this upstart down here, this new little bud for optical systems, which we'll talk about a little bit. Okay, so the easiest gases we look at are pure gases, like CO2 in breath, CO2 in the atmosphere, things like that. Those are the easiest sample preps because you don't have to do anything with them except perhaps purify them, put them in the instrument. The instrument that people are going to use, the use today, and all of you are going to use in the next two days is the dual inlet. This is classic technology. I can tell you right now, the dual inlet is the absolute best way to run numbers. You get your most precise numbers. Here's how it works. Uh, the dual inlet, these are little valves. This is the actual instrument out here. And dual inlet implies that there's two sides. And one thing you need to remember about stable isotope analysis is we always compare an unknown sample to a known sample. So in the dual inlet, we've got one side that's for a reference gas and one side for an unknown gas. And here's how it works. We uh, might send some gas in from a reference cylinder. Those of you in the lab, you'll see a cylinder that looks similar like this. It goes into a volume. It's like an accordion. It flexes, gets bigger and smaller. Sample side can be a gas which is sealed up in a tube. You can break it and release that gas. It'll go into a variable volume. And uh, then that gas, once it's in these volumes, can then be sent out through some valves into the mass spectrometer to get a signal that gets detected. And I'm going to tell you how this works coming, so hold on to that. Uh, and you get a signal. And this side here, though, you can see there's a little pressure gauge, and we've got a bit more gas on this side, and you see we've got a bigger signal. Uh, that's where these variable volumes come into play, because the, the best numbers we get, these are kind of matched, they're kind of the same. So what we do is we make this smaller, and, and the gas goes in faster, we get a higher signal. So those of you that did the dual inlet today, you did this, and those of you that will do it the next two days, you'll, you'll play this game. Uh, the next hardest one, which one of the groups is doing right now with your bulk CN analysis, is uh, looking at, in this case, combustion. So this is just taking organic material, burning it, separating the gases. Almost all labs do this now in, in using a system called continuous flow. All that means is you generate a gas someplace and you push it towards the instrument with an inert gas, in this case helium and the instrument sniffs the peak it goes by and it calculates a ratio. Um, and here's, here's how this works. So this is a diagram of the elemental analyzer. It's got a combustion reactor, a reducer reactor, some way to remove water, a chromatograph to separate some gases, and then it goes off to the instrument. This works by putting some pure nit or oxygen into the system. Uh, dropping a sample in, the sample catches fire, gets really hot, 1800 degrees, that's pretty warm. Uh, when you do that, you form a, a variety of gases, one or two of which may be what you want, and, and the rest of them you don't really care about. So some of those are removed chemically here, others are removed chemically here, water is removed over here, and at the end of that we end up with our product gases in this case, carbon and uh, nitrogen, CO2 and nitrogen, those guys go onto the gas chromatograph, they get separated, nitrogen moves on to the mass spectrometer and gets analyzed and you see a chromatogram that's going to pop up and look something like this, where we have a, a pure, a known reference peak, an unknown nitrogen peak giving us N15 values, and then the magic of the system is, so what's the mass of this guy? N2? 28. And what's the mass of this guy? CO2? 44. So the instrument between that peak right there and that peak right there has to switch all of its settings so that you can get multiple numbers off it. So it's pretty clever. And you'll see that when you do these uh, runs tomorrow. Uh, 
One thing, you have, as I mentioned earlier, everything that we do is compared to a known. So the isotopic value of this unknown N2 peak is compared to this guy, and the isotopic value of this CO2 peak is compared to this guy. That happens throughout everything you're going to do. Another way that we can do this is doing headspace analysis. And headspace analysis, I've diagrammed here with the CO2 equilibration. Did you talk about that, Tom? Okay. Uh, this is a, a way to get the oxygen out of water by equilibrating CO2 in water and the oxygen is exchanged and you can look at the CO2, but the water has taken on the characters, or the CO2 has taken on the characterization of the, uh, the water. And so th here's how this one works. This valve here is going to move around a lot. So we have a double hole needle which will push some sample out, take out the water, and then it just flows continuously. What we really want is just a, a small aliquot of this. So we can do the same thing again, we can do there, and then this switches and another helium source pushes it on to the GC column. So you can do this with equilibration, you can do it with breast samples, you can do it with dissolved inor inorganic carbonate if you're doing that kind of stuff, if you're a rock person. Uh, you can do it with atmospheric samples. So it's a very versatile tool. Uh, one thing that you, one wants to be cautious using this system is that those of you that like to get concentrations, you want to know how much CO2 is in a sample. Uh, because this system is continuously diluted with he helium, the peaks get a little smaller every time. So you have to be a little cautious with uh, concentrations, but the isotopes are good. Uh, and as you can tell, you can get averages of multiple peaks. So this is the gas bench. It gets a little harder here when we do uh, something called carbon reduction, or you might know it as TCA or temperature, temperature conversion, elemental analyzer, all kinds of names for it. But essentially what we do here is we have a very hot carbon oven, and when you drop something into that, you essentially break it into pieces. We, and it can be done with either solids, in which case you drop it in, it breaks apart, or you can do it with liquids and inject, say, water into the system. Um, and in either case, what we're going to form is, in the case of water, we're going to form hydrogen gas at the end, so H2. Or in, for oxygen, and again, in the case of water, we'll form carbon monoxide. And as you can tell, these things all work the same way. We're going to get hydrogen coming off, and then the carbon dioxide will, will come off. So you can get two isotopes for the water sample. You can do solids, you can do cellulose, things like this. So the hardest ones are what we call compound specific. Compound specific is a little different. As you remember those last uh, graphs, what we were doing is generating a gas and then separating gases through the gas chromatograph. Here we do it oppositely. We separate first on the gas chromatograph and then make a gas. So the key here is that if you take a fatty acid, which is not volatile, you have to do some offline preparation to make it volatile so you can then convert it. So you may have heard the term FAMES if you're a compound specific person. So you go from a fatty acid to a, an ester which is volatile and here's how this works. Um, let's say we had a mixture up here and we in inject this mixture in again to a helium stream and it goes to a gas chromatograph and it sits there and nothing happens and we slowly increase the temperature of the gas chromatograph and at the right temperature the first fatty acid will come off goes down and gets combusted uh, things are removed and then analyzed so this is opposite those other systems uh, word of warning on compound specific this is the new kid on the block which you get an awful lot of information out of but the sample preparation can be a couple of weeks before you get here mm -hmm. so this is not for the faint at heart mm -hmm. Also, I changed this chromatogram a little bit because this happens where you might get two fatty acids that come out really close to each other and you've got to sort it out. So be, be careful with, uh, with compound specific. So once we've made these gases, we need to get it to the instrument. And I'm going to show one of the interfaces that allows the instrument to get access to these gases. And the point you want to learn about these, this instrument is the instrument out here has got a hollow glass tube 
it's a, a very low vacuum. The end of this tube is in a very low vacuum. It sits there and it sniffs the whole time. And as the gas passes by, it sniffs it. And that's how it gets its sample. Because this is open to the atmosphere. This is not under vacuum. This is under very strong vacuum. These things actually move around. So this is the universal interface. It's very clever in that you can have a lot of different reference gases. You can dilute them in various degrees. So I've diagrammed those by smaller and bigger tubes. And the same with unknowns. So here's how it works. If you open that valve, the CO2, in this case, can uh, come down. And here's the sniffing part. And the instrument grabs it and analyzes it. And it'll do that the whole time that, that you're letting CO2 come in. If you turn it off, on the other side, you can have an unknown gas come in. Usually you have too much gas, so you get rid of a bit of it. And then it comes through, and there's another sniffer on this side that allows the instrument to look at the unknown. And this is how these universal interfaces work. Uh, before the advent of this, everything was very manual, very slow. A good day was 10 or 15 samples. Now you can run 100 samples tonight while you guys are listening to me talk. So it, it really changed things a lot, having these interfaces. Um, if you have a low flow, low helium flow, you can actually take one of these capillaries and stuff it up inside another capillary. And you get very, you can look at very small samples doing that. So that's called the uh, universal interface. So once we've got gas going into the instrument, it's pretty simple what we do to it. We make some ions, we separate the ions, and we count the ions. And here's how we do that. Here's, here's the, the, infrared, or the isotope ratio mass spectrometer. Send a gas in, bombard it with electrons, make some ions, uh, send those ions down a metal tube called a flight tube. Uh, when these ions hit the magnetic field, they get deflected. Light ones get pushed further than heavy ones. And at the end, you count them. So it's all pretty simple, at least here. So this is how we separate out isotopic species of a particular gas. And I use CO2 as an example. <clears throat> With 44, 45, 46, you can see the isotop, isotopic uh, species there. And here's how they've separated with the heavy one being deflected less than the light one. It happens in, across every gas you do, this is how it, it does it. <clears throat> the way that we can look at different gases here is, let's say this happened to be nitrogen. Well, that weighs different. It's going to move differently. So we change the magnetic field mostly so that we can still hit the same detectors. That's all done by computer. <clears throat> Now we'll go through the, the, the instrument for the three different parts. And the first one is the source. So we, it's a, these are gas instruments. Now <clears throat> we send a gas in, it gets bombarded by electrons. This is like a little hot wire from a, like a light bulb. Once we've formed this positive ion, just think about that as a little magnet. And what we do is we make that little magnet get inside of a repelling big magnet and it shoots it out of there. It gets accelerated, goes past some electrical lenses. That's what these guys are. So we can focus it, move it up, down, left, right, and focus it on the detectors at the end. My favorite part of the whole instrument is the magnet. It's really cool. So I'm going to show you two different cartoons of the magnet because I like it. Um, so if you take a light ion and you make it go through this magnet, it's going to be deflected and bend. So, you know, obviously we're going to throw the heavy one in and it's going to do, you know, the same kind of thing. But I, I like to look at this from the top. So now let's, now you're looking down on the magnet, okay? Magnetic field's coming out of the screen headed towards you. And those of you can think back about your, the right hand rule. Do you remember that from physics? Okay, that's what's going on here. Okay, so let's send the heavy ion through, see what happens when it passes through. Well, it bends. And we send a light one through, and it's going to bend a little bit more. This is the only 
heavy lifting in this whole lecture, this little equation. And okay, so uh, but when you when you look at all the forces on these ions, it all gets kind of summed like that. But that's too much bother this late at night after eating. And it turns out that for any given gas species like CO2, a lot of these are constants. So if you combine those all into a constant, and as, as Albert said, let's just make it as simple as possible, then the equation reduces down to this, and it basically says the radius is proportion to the mass. Okay. And that derivation is in the book, so you want to see how that all comes about. You can look at it in the my manual. <coughs> So just to further it, you, I, I wanted to put these fancy little circles on there so you can actually see that one's really bigger than the other one. Okay. Uh, the detector arrays are called Faraday cups, and their whole purpose is to, um, I'm going to move on from that one, is to uh, be able to count these ions. And the way they do it is pretty clever. Here's our ion. It comes in, and when it touches the Faraday cup, it gets an electron back. Remember, we knocked one off in the, in the, in the source. That's how we made the ion. Well, when we give it an electron back, we form a little current. And we've, as science kinds of folks, have been really good at measuring current for a long, long time. And so the amount of current is proportional to how much electrons we send back. So you can count kind of how many ions were there. And this is how the systems work. So you got these little vibra vibration modes on a water molecule. Well, that's exactly what happens in this laser system. If you bombard a particular molecule with the right wavelength of a laser, it starts to vibrate and, and move around and rotate and things. This is the um, infrared absorption spectra of this particular CO2 molecule. And you see there's lots of bands, and it's pretty complicated. Wait, wait, wait it gets better. What if you want to look at other isotopologues of CO2? Now we've got C12, C13, O18, and all these, all these bands. Well, it turns out that these lasers don't really scan very far. So you have to be clever here and choose some part of the spectra where they all overlap so that you can get all those isotopologues at the same time. And that's what these guys do. Okay? And here's how they do it. You start off with a chamber with a laser and some mirrors so you can bounce this light around. And what you do is you uh, send the laser through and you've got a detector and you get this chamber filled with light and then you turn the laser off. Some of the light leaks out and it starts to decay down to zero. And you measure, how long does that take? Then go ahead and put something in that chamber that absorbs. And you do the same thing, but now it decays faster because some of that energy has been absorbed. And the difference in time from here to here is how they calculate isotopes. And if you choose the right wavelength, you can get all those individual isotopes. Uh, you buy these instruments for specific gases, whether it be methane, CO2, whatever. A little case study, and I was part of this. We got a, a lab decided they wanted to do what I call designer reference materials. So they grew a couple of different plants hydroponically. What they were doing was adjusting the nitrogen in the water so the plant would have a different nitrogen signature. They sent, it's a, called a round robin, they sent the, these materials out to these labs and we all analyzed them and we sent the results back. So here's, there were eight labs and you can see the data. So I want you to remember these graphs. We want to talk about these graphs as we go through because there's some problems on these graphs. I'm going to explain to you where those problems come from. But labs like this one here have a plan to make sure the numbers come out properly. Um, this is a traditional plan that most people use. I'm going to use a slightly different model for the next couple of slides that I've added another component over here, which I call a quality assessment. But what I'm going to talk about applies to matter, no matter what title you put to these things. Um, so we go by a principle of where we treat everybody the same way. 
all our samples are treated identically. And this term of identical treatment came about from who Keith and those guys did that years ago. But Brian Fry and, and another and Carter decided they needed to have a little more information about that. So he broke it down into even more kinds of principles that one should do if you're doing isotope analysis. You know, for instance, let's correct everybody the same way. Let's uh, use the proper reference materials and let's do normalization properly. Let's make sure that when we do error detections, everybody's treated the same way. Um, and so, but we can't talk about all those, so we're just gonna talk about this portion right here. And this is important for you guys, and there's one sentence coming up, which if you take nothing else away from this talk, please take that away. Um, so why do we do this? Well, first, it puts us on the scale so that numbers you get in your lab, Todd understands, Seth understands in his lab, Darren understands in his lab, they're all on the same scale. Uh, <clears throat> you can correct your data off the instruments. The instruments change every day. So you have to be able to correct things back to some normal, some, some set, set of standards. Um, most labs want to keep a record of how well they do things. Reference materials are what you use to, to keep a record like that. Um, and if you want to compare with other labs, then um, you use reference materials to do that. Okay, so take home this message. Your data is only going to be as good as how well you treat your reference materials. If you don't do it right, you, you, you won't know what your data means. Okay, so this is important. <clears throat> okay, so what makes some good reference materials? Well, it needs to be homogenous, needs to be theory, uh, nicely, it would be a pure chemical. Um, something stable that won't change over time. You don't want it to change. Um, if you want to do uh, normalizing, you'd like something that spans. Now, normalizing is just bringing your data onto a known scale. But not everybody understands what this means. So here's an example. So I put on this graph kind of the normal range for some common materials, C3, C4 plants, and some, some marine materials, okay? Properly chosen reference materials would span those materials so that they're on outside of your samples. You get your best corrections if you do that. So you can see, this is one we use, these two. These two materials here you can buy from USGS and get them into your lab and use those. They do a pretty good job of spanning everything. But then you can always run into problems like this, where using the same materials, but let's say I was using it natural gas. Well, if I'm analyzing down here, yeah, I'm probably okay. But if I'm analyzing up here, maybe these aren't the right choices. So what does that mean? What does that mean to you guys? Here's a lab from California, and this is just a subset of their reference materials that they have on their cabinet, okay? This is only one page. And if I break it down to waters, look at, they've got like eight or nine different waters spanning a whole bunch of isotopic ranges. Every lab. So, but in order to do the spanning, you have to have a whole bunch of them. Okay, quality assessment is, is the material we use to say, well, how well did we do? When we ran the sample, did we actually get the right number? And quality assessment materials, now here's a, a couple of examples you can buy from the National Institute of Standards and Technology. One's a ground up peach leaves, one's some animal liver. And this is what they were designed to be used for, looking at trace elements. Um, and when you buy these things, you get a nice little certificate. And on that certificate, there'll be a bunch of numbers for trace elements. And one of the numbers we tend to like is it gives you nitrogen content. That's the number most of you want to see. What's missing from there? It is not certified for stable isotopes. It's not, it's not, it never was meant for that. So what do you do? Well, you, Find your buddies, send them some ground up material, have them analyze it, come up with an average, and say that's, and that's exactly how you generate reference materials if you can't purchase them. 
Okay, normalizing is one of the corrections that we do. And so here's some actual data uh, for nitrogen and for carbon. We happen to be measuring collagen. Normalizing is si simply a linear correction where you take your measured values versus your known and come up with an equation, which you can then apply to your unknown values to bring them back on the line. Does it work? Well, here's some corrected values. Here's the known value. Same down here, corrected and known, same here. So it does work. There may be other corrections, blank corrections, other things, but everybody's going to do this one. So back to our, our little case study at the beginning. Uh, this lab here seemed to have a problem. Those were multiple measurements, and it was off by three or four per mil from everybody else. This was QA keys. They had a failure in their quality assurance. This lab down here, well, they didn't do too bad. Number four, or these labs weren't bad. Number four still had a little problem. But the problem with this particular material is not very homogeneous. And here's an example. One of those spanning materials I showed you comes out of, comes out of our lab in Wyoming. This is those numbers, and here's that number. This is not homogeneous enough to be a reference material. So you have to be very cautious when you select reference materials and make sure they're, that they do what you want them to do. Mm -hmm. Okay?